Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Listen to the Vibes. I'm very privileged to have Mr. Asher Lobb here with me. It's a, a fiddler. That's what we what we call it here in Texas, anyway. That's uh, right. Man, in New I York as well. It's something about fiddle music that uh, I love, and uh, I I don't know about you. I'm a, more of the old country, you know, the Hank Williams Senior Junior. You, my favorite artist of all time would have to be Buck Owens. Uh, oh. You know, all those old guys. You know, I'm not too much into the newer stuff, but there's a uh, there's a few out there that I'll listen to. Um, well, they tend to make it pretty cheesy. The top forties, you know. Yeah, I I have a problem when you mix hip hop and country. That's just <laughs> not a good conversation. You know, well, you know, it's all about the money. Uh, granted, yeah, I understand that. <laughs> but anyway, so there is why they do it. <laughs> but uh, Asher, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so first of all, thanks for having me. Really appreciate you having me on the show. Uh, mm -hmm. It's really a pleasure. And uh, so, yeah, a little bit about myself. I am a violinist, a fiddler. Um, and I'm going to say both of those because they are different. And uh, my origin is as a violinist. Um, I'm a composer, producer, and a live performer. Um, my kind of my upbringing is in upstate New York, a small, small town, uh, Williamsville, right outside of Buffalo. And I was kind of a, a bit of a, an intense upbringing as a classical musician, learning the Suzuki method. And I'm going to say after about 15 years of doing that, uh, taking the, you know, the Suzuki route, um, memorizing Bach and Mozart, that kind of stuff, I, I started to feel like I wanted a little bit more outside of like the sight reading um, experience and the classical orchestra experience. And I started jamming out with the, the jazz band and with some friends who played guitar and drums. And I, I uh, pretty, pretty quickly blended, started to blend in and, you know, uh, started to jam to, to, you know, famous classic rock music. And, and I, I really enjoyed that experience. So I was able to kind of put my own, my own personal, uh, touch to each music with improvisation and improv is really what, what got me, mm -hmm. um, and helped me make the transition really into a professional uh, music career. Because if I, if it was just classical, I think I just would have said, I would have just ditched it. And as my wife said, um, I, I actually didn't choose music as a full-time career. Music chose me quite literally uh, in that it just was paying the bills. Uh, yeah. The I, I chose other careers. Um, I went to New York uh, to, you know, get a bunch of degrees, expensive degrees. And uh, I, I, I just didn't, uh, I didn't feel the same joy and passion in my life uh, as I did with music. Um, and I was basically earning the same money. So I just kind of ditched it and I, um much to my family's chagrin and i i just continued on the music path and and that's uh that's a mouthful right there <laughs> <laughs> are you are you a big charlie daniels fan yeah who is it i mean he's he's uh he's a household name you know oh, yeah you, you can't play bluegrass and not acknowledge him uh i'm not i don't pitch myself as a I don't brand myself as a singer I probably could I I, I just take a lot of pride in the violin and in, in the skills alone that are required to make the violin sound sound good in so many different genres and I I'm trying to take after certain artists like David Garrett Lindsey Sterling the folks that like are just instrumental purely instrumental even though I completely respect like the vocalist uh, type performance but I'm just trying to do something different yeah um we were fortunate enough that uh, we worked the concert for i used to be a security guard and mm -hmm. charlie daniels came here to the austin area and it was just before he passed away so, and i i finally got to see him live working that show man that wow. was incredible that was incredible list. um my i have an uncle that he's passed away but he used to play and uh my my grandfather's barber, he used to play. And I'm going to tell you what, that guy could, I, I don't even know how to explain it. That guy was something else. There's yeah. something about that music. Now, me, I'm more of a classic rock guy. So uh, uh -huh. it, you say you played some You said Big rock. Floyd. 
Pink Floyd. Uh, um, uh, have you played Kansas? Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, uh, um, Dustin, wait, Dustin, would the Dustin wind. the wind be one of those? Yeah, so mm -hmm. I, people people request that all the time, but I definitely play. Yeah, I play Kansas, bunch of classic rock. What, Grew up on classic rock. What What's the most requested song you ever get? Um. I almost said Stairway to Heaven, but uh, there's been a dip in those requests. Uh, kind of one of the most overplayed songs of all time, even though it was, you know, obviously a classic. I don't know if I have one specific request because uh, honestly, I'm doing so many. I'm do I, I'm like an eclectic kind of musician and my clients and my the concert promoters are all pretty eclectic also. So I got a lot of top 40s requests. On on live uh, on on live streams, I get a lot of bluegrass requests. So Charlie Daniels would be one of them. Actually, come to think of it, uh, Devil Went Do Down to Georgia is probably oh, requested course. more than just about any song. Yes, and I'll, I'll like I'll play it last week, and then I'll have like three requests for it the next week. Well, you clearly did not check on my live stream last week, did you? <laughs> <laughs> so being that you have jazz in your background you consider yourself more avant-garde than anything else yeah and i'm not like a straight ahead uh you know jazz type musician i'm more of like a bluegrass type jazz musician so influences like and fusion jazz so chicoria bella fleck they're their major influences he's you know he's you know banjo kind of mandolin vibe and uh He's like a classical, he's like a blend between classical and bluegrass and jazz. So that's always been an inspiration for me as a violinist because I felt like, oh, that's a niche that I can fill and people are interested in hearing that. You know, through my years, I mean, I've I've enjoyed some top 40 stuff and, you know, I like a lot of the you know, radio airplay kind of stuff, but I'm, I'm really into the avant-garde type of musicians or um like Frank Zappa and, and oh, uh, Zappa for sure. Oh my Genius. God. Yeah. Dude, I, I've had more people on that play music along that line on my show than any other really? musician and, and getting into those conversations. I, <laughs> I, I am a Frank Zappa freak. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, a lot of people that get that are enthusiastic about my music live, like in person, they mm -hmm. always bring up Frank Zappa. Like, are you into Frank Zappa? Cause I guess they see some so, sort of association. Um, but yeah, he's uh, him and uh, Captain Beefheart fish. Fish is another fish. one. Yeah. Oh yeah. I've actually seen them live. That was a good show. The yeah. Fish. In Texas. Uh, yeah. They had a uh, Lollapalooza concert. And this was back in 99, I think, 2000, somewhere around there. And uh, you know what I love? Yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say, we just, we got in because uh, somebody asked us to, to work a beer stand. And I, I actually went up and saw some of those bands while I was working. And, and uh, great shows, man. Primus was there. Uh, say, well, it's Alice in Chains was there. It was a great oh, yeah. show, man. Wow, I haven't heard Allison. I haven't heard the name Allison change in like two decades. That's yeah, it's been a while. Uh, one of my favorites actually in high school. But um, the, you know what I respect about um, w w these types of jam bands that we're that we're discussing is like the grassroots rise to the top. Meaning, as opposed to like this typical mainstream major label investment. Like these guys, like they gra like they just developed this fanatic grassroots fan base, mm -hmm. and they uh, they're like playing in Madison Square Garden. It's like it's just it's a nice departure from what we typically hear, yeah, on on the radio. Well, those jam bands you're talking about, man, like Ram Jam and and I mean Leonard Skinner, and yeah, you can just go on and on and on. <clears throat> that that is like the top of my my music my love for music it just yeah. i don't know growing up with the family that played a lot of music me i can barely play the radio but uh <laughs> they the instruments themselves that's more what i'm more into uh -huh. yeah. 
singing stuff is good, but the man, when you get that. a good jam, dude, man. Um, so what? What? what I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm, no, go ahead. No, go I was ahead. gonna say like what I what I I appreciate that. Um, because I, I there's for for a good portion of my career, I've just felt like there's very little space for instrumentalists to really thrive and there's very there's just seems to be such little interest and it could just be all the events that i've been playing a lot of maybe it's like a lot of snobby upscale events um and i i just find that there isn't like this fascination or this appreciation or this attention span for for instrumentals uh to the same degree unless there's like a lot of dancing going on which is kind of what i incorporated if you saw some of my videos into some of the higher energy performances uh but it's like nice to meet people like you and and just other folks uh recently and i'm realizing that there is there is a niche and there is an, a genuine interest for instrumental like virtuosity and instrumental soloists as opposed to them being sort of on the side supporting a singer um because people for many reasons first of all just appreciating the notation and uh the, the chord progressions as opposed to like the vocals and like the lyrics that are essentially telling you the story so it's like I'm making songs like Atlantis that just came out this month, um, the, you know, original singles that are purely instrumental. And I, it's got a story behind it. It's got a narrative. But I, I feel like, you know, when people are asking me, oh, what's the story behind it? I honestly want the listener to project their own story onto it, uh, onto the song. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there's something really enriching about that experience. And, you know, it's a bit of a tension i feel like with the major labels that are pushing i guess more sellable content like here's the lyrics here's the words here's the story repeat it over to all to all your other friends so you know the song goes viral um you know it's sort of like the tiktok generation yeah and uh there's something much more meditative and and something more beautiful i feel uh in in, in doing the instrumental that's why i've sort of just been put my the vocals to the side and just been pushing the the violin well, my kids are in their 20s. My daughter just turned 30. And I, I noticed their generation has been more of the uh, stuff you make on the computer. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, middies. Yeah, there's... Oz. You think that's kind of hurt the musician because of all this manufactured stuff? So that's a really interesting question. Uh, for, I, I think in many senses it has because... As Zuckerberg says, and he literally owns WhatsApp, Facebook, and uh, Instagram, and God knows whatever else. Um, you know, you, the, the, what we do is we disrupt, literally disrupt industries. And I think there was like a good, good thing in that, in that it, it sort of opened, it opened the world up to uh, independent artists. And uh, but then that was that changed with. The major labels buying 40 percent of spotify and pretty much gaming the algorithm to benefit um their their artists by using major playlists that pretty much push them to the top mm -hmm. um and i know this firsthand because i know employees within within spotify who've shared this information with me but without digressing too much um i feel like it's been a good thing and a bad thing meaning the big investors have taken advantage of this new frontier, which mm -hmm. is essentially the internet. Uh, and they've been able to kind of beat out a lot of the, the small artists that were seeing a lot of success. Uh, for me, I w absolutely work my ass off uh, every single day to just like achieve a modest amount of success. Every concert that I play that's like five to 7,000 people is like, that's, that's like a, a big achievement for somebody like me. Whereas you got these major label artists, they're going on tour every night like that. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, with the backing of a lot of funds. So um, I, back, back to what, what you're asking uh, with the middies and the, and the instrumentals and taking away sort of uh, the authenticity of like live musicians. Um, I, I think that I, I find it frustrating in many ways to be like an instrumentalist taking a backseat to a DJ. Uh, so that's, that's the simple answer to your Nothing was simple about my answer to your question. Sorry, <laughs> okay. but I got a lot to say about it, as you, as you can tell. Uh, <laughs> you're still still hearing everything here, um, but I but what I've done is I've adapted. So that uh, what I've adapted, what I've done is I've I've become a DJ myself because I feel like I'm a I'm a producer. I understand what works with a violin, 
Uh, people want a DJ? Fine, I'll give them a DJ. Um, and it'll give me some versatility in, uh, in like live mixing, getting people dancing, but I could still keep the violin kind of featured, uh, you know, during, dan during a dance set or something like that. Live concert, I don't get the DJs. I don't get why. I, I, I feel like there's a lot missing when, when you got a DJ flipping eggs behind the DJ booth. Nobody knows the difference. There's all these crazy lights. Everybody's raving to the song that the DJ didn't make, didn't produce. There's literally no, it's like, there's literally no artistry going on there. It's all about the light show. That being said, I'd show up, you know, just have some fun. But uh, does that make me a little bit like, what the hell? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm not one for this manufactured stuff. I mean, I know that's what's popular, but growing up, man, my, my grandfather was all about country music, bluegrass, and that's what I mostly got to listen to. So that's how I got my appreciation for Buck Owens and Hank King. You know, I could name a, a, probably a million of them, but <clears throat> yeah, my my parents were more into you know the surf music or oh uh, I don't know your Peter Paul and Mary, Bobby uh, Vinton mother, kind of stuff. You know, my mother's a huge fan of Peter Paul and Mary, and I grew up on that also. Yeah. You know, I grew up during the 70s, and, and so you had... Guns N' Roses? Guns N' Roses, Guns N' Roses was late 80s. That was yeah. when I uh, was graduating high school. And, but the 70s, man, you had Zebra, UFO, uh, Sammy Hagar, and Montrose, and Pink Floyd, and even those bands from the 60s were making big hits in the 70s, and... So yeah. I, that's what my generation loved, and, or at least the group that I hung around with. And, and, and then my kids are, are born, and you know my daughter was born in, what, 92? And so then you had your NSYNC and Backstreet Boys and all that kind of stuff going on. And, but you still had bands like Alice in Chains and Nirvana and yeah. what have you. <clears throat> there was a fluctuation there. But then now, everything you hear, it just sounds like some kid sat at a computer, got some uh, music from, you know, Michael Jackson or Prince or somebody, and then added another beat to it and threw some... Yeah poetry on top of it and it looked like everything was starting to die but then I, I i've interviewed a few people and talking to them off air their kids who are 10 11 12 you know the preteens and stuff they're starting to listen to the stuff that i i listened to in high school and i don't know if you noticed like when, when i when i was in high school there was still kind of that 60s kind of coming back, you know, the 60s look and, and sound and everything. Every, people were appreciating that. And then why it took so long, but then the 2000s come around, and then I started noticing 70s stuff was starting to get kind of popular. And here it is 20 years later, 80s stuff is starting to be popular. Maybe there's hope. I don't know what the yeah. consensus is with the kids, but I don't, I, I don't think the kids are making the decisions. Uh, I may be wrong about this. I, I just feel like it's all the major labels that the, the, the money, the big money, they're getting like the private equity funds and they're, they're pushing these songs. And when the kids see it on the big screen and they see it and then they associate, okay, like th this artist or this song, um, is the epitome of like this guy's a superstar top 40s that that's all they need that's the message that they get that they need to listen to that artist or that song this is why i'm saying this because there's no other explanation that i can think of as to why the cyclic as to the cyclical nature of of um popular music i can't really understand why in 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 the 90s alternative music dominated and all of a sudden like in the last 10 years, mumble rap dominated, dominated, dominates the younger, the younger generation. I just think it's a lot of like 
I don't think the kids are choosing. I think they're being told what to choose and they're seeing their friends around them listening to it. And then the peer pressure that, Oh, this is what you got to listen to. If you want to kind of fit in, I, that's just my, maybe it's my cynical ex explanation as to that. With pop culture. And I'm talking like with the uh, top gun Maverick. Okay. So that's kind of a throwback to the eighties. I mean, Top Gun was a big deal when when I was in school, and you've got that '80s soundtrack that goes along with it, and you got shows like Stranger Things comes out, and what was what's her name, Kate Bush, her song yeah. all of a sudden blows up, and you know Metallica is on there and all that. Yeah, I I think that probably has a lot to do with why you're starting to to hear that more often. And you can tell you're yep. getting old when you go in the grocery store and they're playing the stuff you listened to in high school on the speakers. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's nice. Nice. Uh, it, it's nice to go into the grocery store and, and hear music that's, that has a core progression. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, like that alone is a relief for me. And if these kids can just appreciate music for what it really is and not the this industrial churning of, of I'm sorry, it's garbage to me. I don't mean to offend anybody, but it, it is garbage to me. I like the stuff where somebody sat down and actually played an instrument and, you know, you have the progressions and everything else that goes into making a song. And uh, which brings me to to another question. What uh, inspires you to sit down and write? Um, I mean, every day I'm inspired to sit down and write. And what's most frustrating is that I don't get that time because I'm so busy, like running the business side of being an independent artist. Yeah. Uh, I can't even begin to tell you how much like the, the, lo the long list of tasks I have to go through before I can actually get to the studio, which is right over here, um, to do my collaborations with all these talented artists and just release singles every month and connect with my fans. That's all they want to hear. They want to hear my singles. They don't want to hear me blither blather and like, so, uh, you know, just, um, so what inspires me to, to write music is to, to, to to share a message that I feel needs to be relayed and needs to sort of be amplified. Uh, and, and in many cases is universal uh, for my, my listeners that are all over the world. So Europe, Middle East, um, you know, the United States, Canada, these folks are from all walks of life, different languages and uh, different political views and different, di even di different musical tastes. And I write music for all of them. And uh, I, I, what I love about that as an instrumentalist is that I can bring them all together and uh, and they don't even know like they, that's like they're all like talking to each other and connecting with each other in the comments and um, and even in the DMs. And, and it's like it's like a beautiful thing for me because what it does is it fights the powers that divide us. And, yes. And, and I think that's what music's all about. It's like it's given the middle finger to like you know, the politicians and like the big powers and the big money. It's like, you know, we could bring mm -hmm. everybody together and kind of fight what you're doing. It's, it's a good feeling. That's, yeah. that's what inspires me. Mm -hmm. I was talking to a guy that plays saxophone in my last interview. And, and that was the one thing we brought up was how music transcends everything. And it doesn't matter. It seems like that divide is gone when you're at a concert. And people just, they, they, they come together, they enjoy it. At that moment, everybody agrees on, yes, this is, this is, we all love this. Yeah. Everybody's, everybody's happy. Everybody's just enjoying life. It's, I mean, li life is so short. Like, why do we have to, sp why do we have to spend our time on this planet fighting everybody and like, yeah, I get it. You know, you gotta, you gotta build society and improve things, but, but we should be spending, like we could build and build society by, we you know, with love and appreciation for each other and like happy vibes, good vibes. Like that's, that's what it is for me. And that's why, honestly, why I left, um, you know, the corporate world, because mm -hmm. I just felt like I I'm going to be dead in 40 years. Like <laughs> I might as well make this, these years count. Um, and, and I, you know, I realized that uh, I bring this up 
that with a lot of interviews because uh, I, I feel like it kind of sends the message and I don't want my uh, my fans who tune into this stuff to like, well, I don't think they're going to roll their eyes, but they might be like, yeah, we've heard that. But um, if there are any new listeners like, you know, like losing your ability to play music physically, which was my case in uh, seven, eight years ago, and then regaining it kind of reframes your perspective. And that's mm. what it, it's exactly what it did for me. And it's therapy. Uh, it, music is therapy. Yeah. And and I didn't think of it that way until a lot of my listeners needed therapy and they were actually list. They were tuning in to me for that therapy. And I started to think, Oh, maybe there's something to this. Cause I was just doing this to, you know, spread music. <laughs> I, I, I actually a- asked this question for the first time in my last interview, but I'm going to ask you, what's it like having fans? Um, it, it's not, uh, it's not like, what, what's it like? Um, I don't have like groupies where I'm like, you know, I walk outside and it's like screaming people. <laughs> it's not like that. That's, that's what the major labels are all about. You know, everything's orchestrated, but, um, it, it's, it's a hell of a good feeling to get like all these emails in my inbox and DMS from people who just genuinely and authentically like appreciate the music that you're playing. That's so much more valuable than, than um fake screaming fans like people who are just like excited about like lights and and like i don't know like not actually listening to music but like excited about the experience to have people like genuinely love the music that is coming out of your instrument and then feel and then go through the effort to share it with their friends and family that's like that's like love that's like that's like it doesn't get better than that. And, and it just makes me want to keep spreading the, those vibes um, and to see like kind of new people coming in and uh, you know, asking just even like requesting music shows that they care, they care about music, they care about, you know, something other than just the hype. Do you, do you feel like a different person having fans and when you get the, the praise and, and the requests? I, I feel like I'm on a mission uh, because in that sense, that's how I feel like a different person as opposed to when I'm doing a, an event where they're paying you good money, but they don't really care a whole lot about you uh, or about your music. They care more about the influence that you bring to their event, uh, which is like, you know, it's cool paying the bills and uh, you know, I'm grateful to be able to do that. But you need this other. But there's like a part of this. This is other dimension where you just crave um, um, authenticity among your listeners and it's like okay this person over here they can afford one dollar to, to buy a single but 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 they genuinely appreciate your music and then you feel like you're there for a reason otherwise like you know uh why why are they hiring like why are they hiring me like why 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 is like some big company hiring me uh to play violin and people like kind of it's cool for like 10 minutes and then after that it's like okay we're gonna go network over here uh, with our buddies or our peers when they could just bring in a clown to do some juggling act for literally the same time and get excited about it and then go schmooze with their peers. Literally like what's the difference. So, and the clown could have some influence. They could have some followers also on social media. Is there, <laughs> you ever have a pressure to, uh, to go mainstream or you just say, no, nah, that's just, I'm never going to do that. Yeah, I do. Yeah. There's, there's definitely, cause you know, you want, you want, as many people listen to your music as possible. I'm not going to lie about that. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm a, to a certain degree, I am a little bit of a sellout. Uh, and that's part of the reason why I was, why I've made it to some pretty major venues like Madison Square Garden, Carnegie Hall, like some major, uh, like, you know, uh, like festivals been called to, to perform with Kygo and like the other major label acts. Cause, cause I've like, I've had a bit of a business kind of mindset to, to what I do. And I, I can't like, I can't just be a starving artist. Like I got family support. Um, so in that sense, it would kind of uh, be nice, but I don't want to be owned by the labels. Uh, I think there's something really toxic about getting a 360 deal. <laughs> uh, you guys just like Google it. It's, it's just it, the number of people that are assigned to those labels and just get screwed. is unbelievable. Mm. Um, so yeah, I'd be happy with like something in between like a competent manager who really has a passion for your music takes like a percentage out and, and proactively does outreach uh, on your behalf. I mean, even though what I do is different, 
that there is kind of a pressure there when you want to, to be successful on platforms like YouTube and Spotify, iHeartRadio, there you 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 see you get more attention from the controversial stuff or you know pop culture kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. I, I you know I, it's hard to explain, but when when people seem to be gravitated to what essentially is just negativity, it, it's hard to stay positive. And it's hard to stick to your gun sometimes, but I, I kind of sort of tried it. I didn't like it. I want to stick to doing this. I feel like there's enough negativity out there. I, there needs to be some positivity. And we yeah. need to be an influence to the younger generation. Yeah, and, and I, I would, you know, there's a couple of artists that have succeeded at that. Um, not too many that I know of that, that I'm off the top of my head, but there's a couple who have succeeded with exactly your mission and they have, uh, out of the word isn't superseded, but they've overcome, like they've gone, they've, they've overcome like the, the hump or like the, the barrier uh, to entry, uh, which is essentially like taking off your pants, getting naked or like doing something really controversial that pisses off either side or like, mm -hmm. or getting hyper political or something like that. And they've managed to like stay neutral with all those controversial topics they managed to bring folks together um, on many in, from many different areas, and that's that's really my dream. Like, if I were to go major, uh, I would want to do it in that in that vein, and I would want to kind of show people the uh, how that would be my message. That would be my message that like you don't have to you don't have to succumb to the the, the requirements of social media and the labels that okay, we got to piss people off in order to like get the get to the top. You know, the top shouldn't be about that. It should be about um, authenticity, love, appreciation, building people up and not tearing them down in like odd ways. Yeah. You know what what's frustrating is when I was in, in school, in junior high and high school, I got into drinking and drugs and all that kind of stuff. And, you and everybody it, else. Yeah. There was so many of us that did. And it, it, a lot of it. The, the bands that we listened to, it was all about partying and all that. Yeah. And I, I interviewed JJ French from Twisted Sister and oh. he did, he didn't drink. He didn't do drugs. And, and I thought, you know, if, if we were exposed to that side of it, that there were musicians, I mean, Gene Simmons, he wasn't a drinker. He didn't do drugs. I love kiss. And if they right, he had, gives off the impression that he does, like yeah, that's his vibe, that's his branding. Yeah, that's the whole thing. Is they didn't have their anti-drug songs. They it was all about partying and you know that kind of thing. Yeah. And, and I, I think if these bands had openly been able to say, you know what, I I have no desire to drink or get into this other stuff, that might have been a difference in my life. And I think it's why you should stay true to who you are and to influence what they could be your age. They could be older. They could be younger. If they see somebody that's being successful and they don't have to rely on substances that could, that could change someone's life dr dramatically. Absolutely. Um, and when you, when you mentioned Kiss, it kind of pisses me off that like this is they're one of many examples where I don't think they own their their brand. I think that they, you know, generally, genuinely, generally, when you when you make it to that level, you have a lot of uh, stakeholders in the big money and you have a lot of management and you got a lot of, you know, a lot, a lot of other leadership that are telling you, I do or don't want you to do this. Um, and. Yeah. Um, so, so when you, you, when you bring this up, like, you know, all my friends, you know, drinking, doing drugs, that kind of stuff. Yeah. I grew up that way also. And, and that was tip. It's literally, it's, it's more common than not. Uh, and it's in the culture and who builds the culture. It's not the kids. It's, it's, it's society. It's the, it's yep. the major influencers. Um, and it keeps going. And actually 
this, these systems feed off of each other and it's at the expense of kids. I mean, think about how many people are getting sick today yeah. and are losing their careers and their lives and, and are ending up in jail uh, because of the system that just keeps failing them. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I was a teacher in the South Bronx uh, for four years and it, it makes me furious uh, as somebody who really genuinely cares about these kids who have just been given the short end of the stick from so many different vantage points broken families and everything these kids they have these kids they want to succeed and they mm -hmm. and, and and they're just like they start out at an early age with this this identity with this you know already at the short end of the stick already like malnourished in some cases sick not 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 being taught like what proper nutrition is what proper like upbringing is like no backyard just you look at where they're living like by a, by a, a highway anyway and it's like and then the values and then the messages coming from their peers and so on and so forth. I don't get, I don't get digressed too much, but I got a lot to say about this. And I just think that if the systems and, and, and the, the money that's supporting these systems really genuinely cared about improving society, um, uh, you wouldn't have these types of problems yeah. among, among youth. I mean, JJ is an awesome guy and he flat out told me that his management said, you can't let people know that you don't party. And that could have made a big difference. We need it. We need to, to you know, it, I'm with you on this. I'm very passionate because it took a lot for me to overcome all, all those substances. And uh, when you can put out a positive message and let these kids know this is, this is the consequences you're probably going to face if you get involved in this stuff and like you said, peer pressure, the, the system, I mean, how long did it take for nerds to be really accepted? Because back when, when we were in school, if you didn't drink, you didn't party, you were a nerd and that was the worst thing on earth to be. And it's painful. It's painful, you know, for these, these kids to walk through the halls and not, and just to be left out. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, you know, some of them shift away from being a nerd because, it's, again, it's too painful. Some of them commit suicide uh, and others just, you know, are able to kind of withstand that kind of pressure. But even the folks within, like, even the kids within, like, the popular movement of, like, hey, let's go get partying, get smashed and completely lose our sense of reality and get in car crashes and what total, you know, just, like, ha have stories to share with our friends about how we got our ass grounded for, for like, a week. Um so we can get whatever, uh, impress, impress our buddies, you know, that I, I don't think they're happy either. I've, I've seen so many of my, my friends, like just unhappy, like what's, if you're going to go out party, have a good time, at least you should like feel good about it. You don't even feel good about it at the end. It's just, okay. You, you tell a story and anyway, I'm, I'm preaching to the crowd here, but, uh, when you mentioned, what was his name? The, the, the artist. Oh, JJ French. JJ. Yeah. So like, he's one of a number of stories. I, I know I have a number of, also like insider stories from major label performers like um um folks from like well forget about the beatles uh but uh uh this is killing me not guns and roses uh not pink floyd ah <laughs> um lead singer of um oh this is really this is really killing me anyway one of the biggest oh rolling stones thank oh, you mick jagger it's, it's been a long week for me, Mick Jagger. Yeah, uh, I, I know. Uh, I I was just actually on a ride to Philadelphia two weeks ago with the drummer who like lives next I, <laughs> lives next door to the manager of of uh, Mick Jagger. I'm like, yeah, you know these guys do drugs, right? He's like, actually, um, I, I can tell you with a hundred percent um, like confirmation that they do, they do not. Mick Jagger, he may give off, give off that impression and all the the performance, but these guys are like vegetarians like not that that's i'm not advocating vegetarian but it's still like says something about like how they they are interested at least in their health uh that that's what i mean by that um they you know mick jagger is a workaholic uh and he and he's got his head screwed on pr pretty tight he's he's got a he doesn't drink doesn't do anything and th that shocked me because I, I i mean would you have assumed that he didn't that he wasn't a party animal or that he wasn't like, that's not the, the branding that he, that he gives off. Well, and the thing is, is back in the sixties and I think even the seventies, there were some times they got busted. So, uh, 
I mean, they may have at one point and said, decided, hey, this isn't for us. I mean, I, I know when it comes to Keith Richards, he's infamous for all the things that he's done. At least that's the stories we get. And that's, I, so that's the impression we get. So here's the thing. Like, you may be right. Um, I'm, I'm a bit of a cynical guy. I don't, um, I don't always believe whatever the news, I, I don't know how much of it is, is fabricated to kind of have a, a, a headline story. Um, I don't know if it matters, but what I do know is that I, you know, I heard this message pretty much from, you know, a direct source and he was pretty confident that they don't touch anything. And maybe again, you're right. Maybe you're right that they did in the past, but maybe they didn't. And it was a story and it was um, kind of, they did have some major PR people working for them. So we don't know how much of that played a role. Anyway, it's all, you know, being the bad boy is more popular than being the, the good guy. And that's probably part of the whole PR thing. They may be saying this in up front, but you know, behind the scenes, they may be is, you know, perfectly straight. Don't, I don't know. Let, let me ask you, uh, did, did you have programs as a kid uh, called D.A.R.E. where yep. the police, they come in? So that's, I guess that was nationwide. I don't know, it was like during the Reagan era or something. I remember mm -hmm. that as a kid. I, I didn't feel like they were all that effective. Um, I felt like, okay, here's like an authority, somebody like, somebody who the cool kids aren't necessarily going to be listening to or respecting or seeing like, or like, or seeing as a mentor. They're coming into the, to the classroom and saying, don't do drugs, kids, don't drink. I think the impact that that a, a rock star has on saying, guys, don't do drugs, don't drink, is significantly greater than somebody who's like from within the system incarcerating people. Mm -hmm. I, I just think they went about that uh, in a pretty ineffective manner. I think they if they went about it at, uh, from the the influencer standpoint, it might have had more a better impact mm -hmm. over many generations. You know as well as I do. It's and, and you can see it like when you have a little kid and you tell them don't do something, that's what they're going to want to do. And the whole if thing they hear from, yeah. Yeah. You know, from a, from a parent and you say, don't do this, they're going to want to do it. But if they had a friend of theirs who said, you know what, don't do that. They're more than likely going to listen. Some, someone that can really connect with them on a different level than what a, like a parent or an authority authoritative figure is with someone else yeah it's, that's, and that's just, pretty much what the musicians are in, in many yeah. many ways like the listeners they look up to them i cut you off yeah you're, you're oh no something. no 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 that pretty much uh, i'm gonna repeat myself <laughs> but uh, there's gonna be someone out there it could be i don't know uh, a guy that's working construction or something or a stay at home parent, uh, even a kid, they're not sure what they want to do in life or they want to do something that, oh, let's say, for instance, me, I wanted to I wanted to move away from um, where I grew up and wanted to change my my whole uh, career. And it got that, oh, no, you need to stick with what you're doing and, you don't, know, you know, the, you need to stay safe. But they really want to do something else in life. What what kind of advice would you give them? Well, uh, so um, I, I don't know that I'm the best example of like practicality because, um, again, because of my traumatic experience seven, eight years ago, I pretty much became impractical to an extent. Um, I mean, it helped that I, I was able to pay the bills and, um, as a musician and I was, and I had a certain degree of demand uh, and I was in like a major metropolitan area where there, there is money and, and, and there were opportunities, a lot of opportunities. Um, but, but if there is an opportunity that may be a little bit of a risk and you're absolutely miserable and you can't function, uh, doing what you're kind of being told to do and you, you have a skill and you have a talent that may lend itself to some certain degree of success. And you're seeing that there may be something there. It's worth a little bit of a risk to change the rest of your life. If 
you know, if it's a bit of a pipe dream and the competition's insane and you have no plan, uh, probably best to stick with like, you know, paying the bills. So you don't end up on the street somewhere. Um, but um, I think that now that today uh, with enough focus and, and organization, uh, the world could be your oyster and so many opportunities that didn't exist prior to like the 2000s are there right in front of you and uh, in front of us. And for me, I, I haven't, I haven't achieved my, my ultimate, you know, hope, um, uh, dream of, of, uh, musical success in the sense of like, in the sense of like being able to pick and choose the types of events that I play, um, and the impact that I'm looking for my music and my message to have on listeners. Um, so I'm still also, I'm, I'm in that place where I'm taking some risks, a good number of them to get to that next level. Um, so in that sense, I, I, I would be an advocate of that because if I hadn't taken those risks, I wouldn't have ended up where I am now. You know, I would have, would have ended up actually I have a nursing degree. Um, I have a teaching degree. I would have, you know, still been teaching, um, found a way for, for, for it to, you know, to find joy in as many aspects of that as possible. So yeah, that's a long winded answer to your question. <laughs> it's pretty compl complicated. <laughs> well, and, and you've had some bumps in the road along the way. Can you talk about those experiences? Yeah, bumps. I would say to say the least. Uh, major. I was, I was trying to be kind. <laughs> I know, and I appreciate that. And you don't necessarily know what people are thinking, and a lot of people would be sensitive. I think to share a story like this, myself not being one of those one of those people, because I'm pretty much an open book. I might write a book on it. Speaking of books, um, I don't, um, I, I, uh, I, I, long story short, not to bore people too much. Uh, I, I developed adrenal insufficiency seven years ago. That's what, when I lost the ability to lift my instrument impacted me physically in every aspect. My brain was pretty much the only thing I was working. I was a vegetable for months in a wheelchair, blah, blah, blah. Um, prior to that, I had an inflammatory condition that that's what I, I was diagnosed with. Like, I don't know, 2006. Prior to that, I was the only guy in the orchestra in high school having difficulty holding the instrument in a sustained manner, didn't know what was wrong with me, uh, was just told, okay, maybe it's just in my head or whatever. Um, in retrospect, I'm kind of laughing and I'd love to go back to the folks that told me it was in my head because I was literally like, I, I pretty much almost lost my life. But um, that, that very dark period, um, I think, gave rise to a new me uh, and some people it would have broken them for me. It, uh, it broke me temporarily and then it built me up, gave me an opportunity to, to renew myself um, personally uh, kind of gain a new sense of confidence that, Hey, if I could get myself better, despite literally all odds. And I say literally all odds, like I should not be sitting here right now talking to you about my career. I shouldn't be sitting here at all talking to you, actually. Um, then why can't then there's a whole lot of other things that I can do. And I feel like I'm on a mission to share uh, this story and by extension that message with uh, so many of people out there who might be sitting uh, watching this, listening to my music, maybe uh, watching some other interviews, thinking, um, you know, I am, I'm just, I got, I got the short end of the stick or I, I'm not capable of being a functional human being. There's just no other way for me to get out of this, this snag that I'm in. Um, I can't boost my income. I can't get healthy. I can't like, I can't build myself up. I can't build up my confidence. Um, I, I, I can't tell you how many times I felt that. And, and, uh, just, just ignore all the voices, ignore the people telling you you can't just, just ignore them. They're just, they don't know what they're talking about uh -huh. and just, just be yourself and do what you want to do. Cause again, life's really short and yeah. nobody's, none of these people are going to matter in 40 years. N none of them, like the, none of the people who disagree with you are going to matter. Um, God, I wish I could go back and tell my old high school self, don't worry about what those other kids say. Cause after four years, it's never going to matter again. They don't care about you. You don't care about them. Uh, I felt the same way. I feel like I want to tell my younger self, just stop trying to be like them. Stop trying to like, stop trying to party with them. Just, 
just like ignore the entire youthful waste of time. Just focus on your dreams and just try to achieve them. And ah, the peer pressure thing is really can be painful. Yeah, that's no lie. Well, I'll tell you, there's there's somebody out there that's watching this or listening to this, and life has probably been cruel to you. But you've got to 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 focus on the, the positive. I mean, my I've told the story a million times about the, the disease that I have in my spine. And I went from, you know, being a, a productive member of society to being in a wheelchair. Several surgeries later, I'm up and moving again, but I'm going to eventually be back in that wheelchair again. But I'm going to make the most of it before that happens and it's it's instead of being that person laying on the couch feeling sorry for myself i took podcasting more serious and my mission is to go out and inspire other people and when someone like you comes on and 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 you've gone through something similar you can be that positive influence on them as well that's uh, why i appreciate hearing stories like yours and and giving someone out there that that hope that you can make you can actually make lemonade out of lemons it's a cliche but you can do it if you really want to this has given me so many opportunities to meet so many wonderful people and make so many wonderful friends and to get private messages saying, thank you. I needed to hear that message. Thank you for that guest. That puts me on cloud nine. And uh, I appreciate you. I appreciate your time. And uh, do, you, do you have a website? Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, so my site is uh, asherlaub.com, A-S-H-E-R-L-A-U-B. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I could be found on all major platforms, uh, Instagram, TikTok, uh, Facebook, uh, YouTube. My music videos are there. My independent or sorry, my original music's on, you know, like Deezer, Spotify, iTunes, pretty much anywhere you can you can check out the music. Just search my name, Asher Lob. I think I'm the only one in the country <laughs> with that name, as far as I know. <laughs> so, can't be missed. No excuses there, guys. Check it out. Uh, and I, I, I didn't... Um, I mean, I wish I could like extend the interview to find out more about your story, but uh, I'm. Uh, I want to thank you for letting me tell mine. Oh, man, that's that. That was my pleasure. You you helped to inspire others, and, and that's that's our goal. And um, you you said you had some new music that was out. You can find that on your website. Yeah. So uh, Atlantis is the most recent single. Uh, that is that is out you can find it anywhere um and uh you know there's also I, I, every month i'm releasing music but atlanta is something i'm really proud of that's uh that's something that i you know hopefully people will will enjoy and feel free to dm me or you know, post a comment let me know that you uh that you checked it out well, i'm going to put all your links in the description so people can click on it and go straight to it and if when you have something new come out let me know i'd like to help promote it Oh, that's so nice. Of you. I really appreciate that. Thank you. I, I thank you for reaching out to me. That that meant a lot. And uh, I, yeah. I appreciate your message, too. Yeah, well, it's my pleasure. And uh, I hope that that you uh, are able to, to heal your body. Well, I'm working on it. I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. Yeah. You know, just one day, the, at a time. one day at a time. You don't just don't give up, you know, even even if you fail don't give up you gotta at least try make it a, yeah. a fight but um uh, again thank you for your time I, I wish you all the luck in the world and many blessings to you and your family and thank you so much all of you out there if if you stop by and you're new to the channel i thank you for that um uh, please come back hit that subscribe button for those of you who are regular your support it has meant everything to me. I know I say it at the end of every show, but it really does mean so, so much. And so until the next one, everyone, please take care. Be kind to one another. God bless and peace. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Listen to the Vibes. 
You can catch us on Buzzsprout or wherever you listen to your favourite podcasts. And on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook at The Vibes Broadcast Network.